Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, that was quite an elaborate introduction, and it saves me having to go over it myself, quite frankly. For today, uh, what I want to go over is discussing what are sustainable, how can we build sustainable communities using technology and artificial intelligence. I was going to go into a little bit about me. I'll keep it short. I don't want to. I don't want to repeat myself. Um, so I lead Girls in Tech Dublin. Girls in Tech is a global women in tech organization. I created it over three years ago, and now we're one of the leading women in tech and female entrepreneurship organizations here in the country. We're also global in scope. We create programs that help women succeed in their career trajectories. I myself have had a very unconventional career trajectory. I started off coding at a very young age, at 10. I was very much into coding. However, I did my Bachelor's of Science in Politics uh, at the University of Ottawa. I'm Torontonian, if you couldn't tell by the accents. And my Master's of Science at the London School of Economics. Um, so I didn't go into computer science or computer engineering as, was the, as would have been expected. Uh, but somehow I made my way back into tech. I worked my way from being a business analyst to going to products. I was a product innovation lead at Accenture's Digital Innovation Lab here in Ireland. Um, and I also created a startup in Toronto. It was a digital app for the translation system. So I made my way back into tech. And I'm very much passionate about making an impact in the world. This is one of my core values and what I believe in. Um, and, and now to go into artificial intelligence. Well, it's quite contentious and quite divisive, right? Here we have two tech giants, um, Elon Musk and Jack Mao, and they don't agree, right? There are two different philosophies around this. Is AI for good? Uh, Elon Musk on one side, you know, no. Uh, the pace of technology is faster than us. This is what he genuinely believes. And Jack Mao contending that we don't know everything and we can't continue to worry. Let's, le let's keep the pace going. Well, I want to frame, that, frame the conversation using that uh, moral argument because, you know what, when we're talking about how can we build a more sustainable community, we need to understand the moralities behind artificial intelligence and using technology. But for now, for the case of this pre presentation, we're going to focus on how can we leverage AI for good. So what is sustainability, right? Let's break it down, let's re-engineer it. Um, I'll give you a clue. Um, this is actually my garden at home. It's my permaculture garden. I live in Scaries here, uh, right outside the city of Dublin. Um, to the right, you see my garden's, uh, my neighbor's lawn, uh, my neighbor's backyard. Uh, that's how I actually got my backyard. It looked just like that, just uh, grass, uh, some shrubs in the back, and you can see mine to the left, right? Completely different. <laughs> um, everything's growing, everything. You don't, you don't need to touch anything. Um, and this is kind of out of laziness for me, because I want to create a garden that was sustainable, that can just take care of itself. I don't have to do anything. It ha you know, it, uh, rain gives it water, it has all the nutrients it needs, um, it has uh, wood chips which give it the nutrients, I have 10 fruit trees in there. I don't need to touch a thing. It has everything it needs. Um, and there are many definitions about what is sustainable. What is sustainability? Um, and sustainability, in the simplest form, is the ability to exist uh, constantly. That's what it is at its basic functional form. And that's what my garden is. Um, and if I need to convince you, if there are any climate deniers uh, here, um, I do know a girl, a very, a very Dutch girl, who will, um, who will set you straight. So hopefully, uh, we can go into this conversation about how technology and how AI uh, can be better used to promote sustainability uh, from an ecological perspective in this presentation. Um, and to start off with, every aspect of our lives is impacting the planet, whether that's starting a family, commuting to work, ordering at a restaurant, buying stuff, loads of stuff, um, how we, you know, how we uh, deal with modern-day agriculture, it's all interrelated. These are habits that won't change overnight. And we have less than 30 years, according to the science, and even less according to Greta, uh, to save our species. And we need every help that we can get. In India, AI has already helped farmers get 30% higher yield in their groundnut uh, per hectare by providing information on their land, on fertilizer, and on, on choosing sowing dates, for example. But more than that, there are incredible companies using AI to help save our planet. So who are those? I'm going to bring you those. One, for example, Rainforest Connection. Anyone heard of them? No? 
Okay, no, but one person. Awesome. Uh, so Rainforest Connection is a Bay Area not-for-profit. They use AI uh, tools such as Google's TensorFlow in conservation efforts around the world. Its platform can detect illegal logging in vulnerable forest areas by analyzing... Sorry, something happened to my screen. Sorry, Simon. There we go. I can see where I am now. Oh, it's... Uh, perfect. Awesome, I can see it now. Um, so its platform can detect illegal lo logging in vulnerable forest areas by analyzing audio sensor data. Um, this is a great example of how we can use big data to save the world's most threatened rainforests and habitats. It's also vital to supporting many of the world's poorest communities. As you can imagine, uh, some of these communities rely on the rainforest for food, uh, shelter, and livelihood. I don't want to go into that. Amazon fires uh, kind of uh, expose that in the media. So, there's also a company called Air Shepherd. Um, animals are going extinct, and not just because of the climate, but because of poachers. So far, uh, foot patrols and drone-based surveillance have not been effective at preventing poaching, and these efforts are very labor-intensive and under-resourced. Uh, but one company, as I mentioned, Air Shepherd, uh, using AI technology which automates the process of detecting poachers in infrared, infrared video feeds and freeing park rangers of other tasks and increasing the availability of increasing the reliability of surveillance. So this is pretty cool. And we can see here the infrared um, imaging right there showing the animals and the poachers uh, approaching them. Um, the drones that they have created, um, they're trained um, in AirSim technology, and they now pick up up to 80% of the poachers, um, so they're quite effective and reliable. And it's been deployed in places like Botswana and South Africa for, for now. Um, anyone know of these, what these majestic beans snack on? Um, anyone? Pretty much everything except us. They don't eat us. Killer whales do not eat us. Uh, we're, the, we're the only species on the planet that actually can hunt them. Um, so they're on top of the food chain, but they also like a lot of fish, and a lot of fish like salmon. Um, but since the 1980s, salmon populations have declined by up to 80% in some natural fisheries around the world. The World Wildlife Fund suggests climate change has had a significant impact on salmon survival rates. But by using artificial intelligence um, and Microsoft grants, uh, Seattle-based conservation organization Long Live the Kings has been able to compile large data sets to answer questions around salmon population disappearance. And by doing so, they've been able to, then they've been able to uh, create predictions and preventative solutions to future questions around environmental changes. And what about stuff and trash? This Dutch company, Ran Marine Technology, is hoping to eliminate some of the multi-million uh, tons of plastic in our oceans. And they've developed an aqua drone that sucks up garbage from the water. It's called the uh, Waste Shark. It's pretty cool. Um, and it can eat up to 200 liters of trash in one trip. It's zero carbon, also uses AI to monitor water and air quality. For now, it's only used in small marinas and small areas and not the ocean. So it's quite small scale. Anyone seen the documentary on Netflix, Chasing Coral? No one's seen it. Okay, go watch it after this. Okay. <laughs> um, coral reefs are deteriorating around the world as a result of climate change and greenhouse gas emission. I hopefully don't need to tell you that. They are extremely sensitive to acidity and temperatures and toxins. 50 Reefs is an initiative by the Ocean Agency. And what they do is they combine advanced image technology with AI to gather and analyze images of shallow water reefs at scale and within seconds. What has this done? So using deep learning, the AI is able to recognize different types of corals based on their colors and textures, giving scientists a powerful array of information to track the effects of climate change on coral populations around the world and make more informed decisions on how to ensure their survival. And what about food diversity? Um, Airlitex is an AI and machine learning software that is currently being used in drones. While it was originally devel developed to automate greenhouse management processes, it could quite easily be used to manage the health of national forests. Airlitex has the capacity to not only collect temperature, humidity, and carbon dioxide data, but the AI can also analyze soil and crop health. But as we need to plant over a trillion trees to combat climate change right now, we could use an early text to speed up efforts. 
And on topic of food, well, these solutions are all great, but limited in scope, as they're very small scale and quite nascent. So where do we go next? How can we pave the way forward? Well, for one thing, maps can become exponentially better. AI can be used to create maps for aerial imagery, information retrieved from social media data, for example. This could allow us to have more accurate and well-annotated maps to inform things like evacuation planning, delivery of relief, and damage assessment efforts by comparing scenes immediately before and after a disaster, for example. AI has already helped researchers achieve 80, 89 to 90 percent uh, complete accuracy in identifying tropical cyclones, weather fronts, and atmospheric rivers, the latter of which can only cause um, heavy precipitation and are often hard for humans to identify on their own. So quite handy, right? By improving these weather forecasts, these types of programs can help to keep people safe. And companies can get involved too, and they can see the commercial advantage of using AI for good. For example, Microsoft's AI for Earth program committed over 500 million to create and test new applications for AI to help the planet. One vision for sustainable cities is to create an urban dashboard consisting of real-life data on, on energy, water use, traffic, and weather to make cities more energy efficient and livable. In China, for example, IBM's Green Horizon project is using an AI system that can forecast air pollution, track pollution sources, and produce potential strategies to deal with it. And there's also the matter of education training. We can't, we can't put aside the fact that there aren't enough data scientists out there and um, not enough female data scientists out there either. We need more people studying data science. We need greater access to data to create some of these um, tools, and also eliminating tech shelf, right? Some of these applications are created, but then tech shelved, in, in so that um, the, the right expertise to know how to operate the technology in the long term is not there. So then they get shelved. They're not being used. Overall, um, so I hope you took away a few things. Uh, why it's detrimental to build communities that are sustainable, uh, and including what is uh, sustainability, how we can use AI better in this fight, how we are currently using AI, how we're nascent to help improve the sustainability of our communities by using some of the examples that I've shown you of some companies doing really great work, and lastly, what we need to be watchful of moving forward and how we can close the gap. Hope you enjoyed this, and until next time. Thank you, guys. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, Carl. Yeah, um, thank you. Really fascinating uh, to see all these different uh, projects worldwide um, working on these really positive, impactful um, uh, yeah, projects, essentially. Um, I won't keep you too long because I know it's a little bit over and I know how angry people can get when we keep them from their coffee. But uh, just, a, just a quick question. Yeah, sure. um, you mentioned, yeah, as you said, all these projects worldwide, but is there anything actually going on in Ireland that you know of or any kind of project you're working on yourself it, that, that, that runs along these lines? Um, I would say most of the projects are based outside of Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, there haven't been a large source of funding for some of these companies to get off the ground. I'm not sure if we've covered that already in previous presentations, but that could be one source of conversation within policymakers, is to put greater uh, levels of funding to help mm -hmm. these companies survive and to do cool stuff um, like some of these Dutch companies are doing, these Chinese companies are doing, and some of these San Francisco-based companies are doing. Yeah, amazing. Yes. Well, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank was you so wonderful. much. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank Carl again. Thank you. Um.